Hello, E11. Welcome to the second part of uh, GCSC PAGs. In this section, I'm going to explain uh, the next three PAGs, which is PAG 4, the ripple tank, the waves PAG, then PAG 5, which is a specific heat capacity one, and PAG 6, which is the IV characteristics. Um, as I said in the previous one, on each slide, there is a link to the video, which takes you to the demo of the PAG. But since I made this into a video, you would not be able to click on the links. Hence, like the previous one, I'm going to add those links in the description so that you can click there and go to the videos. OK, then let's move on to the PAGs. So the fourth PAG is about measuring waves, investigating water waves using a ripple tank. So you have already studied the wave equation, which tells you that wave speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. So using the ripple tank setup, what we are going to do is we will set up uh, waves on the ripple tank or we will set up water waves on the ripple tank. So just rewind your memory how we did this in the class. And once the waves are clearly seen on the ripple tank, we will first find their wavelength, then we will find the frequency, and then we will multiply both of them to give you the speed. So let's see how we are going to first measure the wavelength. So wavelength is a distance between uh, two consecutive waves, isn't it? Similar points between two consecutive waves. But uh, if you remember, or if you're able to recall, these waves are so closely packed. So what we will generally do is we keep a ruler on the frame and in, we keep the ruler in the frame. And with the ruler in the frame, we take a picture. We take a photo of the waves. Once we take the picture from the picture, we will find the distance, uh, the length of 10 waves and then divide it by 10 to get the length of one wave, which is our wavelength. The reason why do we do this is in order to improve the accuracy. It was going to be really difficult to find the distance between just two waves because it is so small. So there will be a lot of uncertainty in what we are doing. So to avoid that, we find the length of 10 waves, divide it by 10, and we get the wavelength. You can keep the ruler at uh, different positions, repeat the experiment, and then find a average value for the wavelength. Moving on to frequency, when we create these waves, you will be able to see that they keep on moving. So you have studied that frequency is a number of waves passing through a point in one second. It's not at all going to be easy to count the number of waves passing through a point in one second. So like we did for the wavelength, let's do the number of waves uh, passing through a point in 10 seconds. But still, it's not going to be easy. So what we will do is we will keep a stopwatch in the frame and then we will video the waves. Then we play the video back in slow motion and count the number of waves in 10 seconds. We will divide it by 10 to get the number of waves in one second. Now you have to be really careful here when you're finding the wavelength, you need to definitely make sure the meter rule is in the frame. Otherwise, the scales won't match when once you take the picture. And similarly, once you're doing for the frequency, please make sure you have to definitely say that the stopwatch is in the frame while you're videoing it. Otherwise, the time frames will be different. Stopwatch outside and the stopwatch in slow motion will not be having similar 10 seconds. OK, once we have this again, you can uh, video it at different instances and then find an average value for frequency. Once you have an average value for frequency and wavelength, you just need to multiply them and find the speed. So this one also I have a link attached to a video. Uh, the link will be there in the description. So with that, we are moving on to the specific heat capacity PAG. So we have done this in year nine, which was I do agree once upon a time. So there's a chance that you have forgotten bits and pieces or the whole thing. So we have we are going to refresh that here. So you are finding the specific heat capacity of a metal block. 
since it is something to do with heat, we need to make sure that we have a heat proof mat with us. And we do the setup as it is shown on the screen there. Before you start doing something, if you think about the equation for specific heat capacity, it has mass in it. So the first thing that you need to be doing is before you do all this setup, once you have the block with you, using the mass balance, you find the mass of the metal block. You record it in your table there. And once you have done that, we put in, we do all the setup that is shown in the diagram or on the screen and you put in the thermometer. Before you start heating, you find the initial temperature of the block. Make a note of that, then you start heating it. So we generally heat it for a set time. Uh, there is no nothing like you have to do it for five minutes or you can only do it for five minutes. We generally say five minutes, so under the impression that we would be getting a decent increase in temperature. So we heat it for five minutes. And once we have heated it for five minutes, we switch off the heater. You look into the joule meter and you record how much energy was transferred to the heater. And at the same time, you need to read the final temperature also. So now you have all the data that you need. Using your initial and final temperature, you can calculate the change in temperature. And the equation to find C is E equals MC delta theta. So to find C, you need E, M and delta theta. E is the energy transferred, which the joule meter will give you. M is a mass of the metal block, which you have found initially. And delta theta is the change in temperature, which is final temperature minus initial temperature. As usual, this one also has a link which you can watch. Uh, and see the demo of the experiment. Now in this experiment, there is a couple of things that you need to keep in mind regarding the accuracy. One, we have assumed that all the heat coming from the heater has gone to the metal block, which is not ideally correct. Especially in the diagram shown, there is no insulation. So there is definitely heat loss to the surroundings but we haven't considered that in our calculations, which is definitely going to make a value of a specific heat capacity uh, inaccurate. Another thing you have to keep in mind is you switched off the heater and don't take the reading of the temperature thermometer immediately. So because if you switch off the heater, you will still see the thermometer reading increasing. So just wait. Just wait for the thermometer reading to go to a maximum value and then it will start to decrease. Make a note of that maximum value of uh, temperature and that will give you a more accurate result. So a very popular question with specific heat capacity is that uh, why is our calculated value different from the actual value? So wherever possible, say about insulation and then the point about temperature. And the last one on uh, in this video is PAG6, which is the IV characteristics. So as per your specification, you need to know the IV characteristics. I stands for current, V stands for potential difference or voltage. Uh, so you need to know the IV characteristic of characteristics of a fixed resistor, a filament lamp and a diode. The circuit diagram is exactly the same for everything. The only difference that will happen is this, what you see here is a, a fixed resistor. Once you finish with the fixed resistor, all you need to do is remove that fixed resistor from there and replace it by a symbol of a filament lamp. Once that is done, remove that from there and replace it by a symbol, by the symbol of a diode. So initially, if we think about the fixed resistor, this is a circuit diagram. And then we start the experiment and then we have a variable resistor in the circuit diagram, as you can see, which is our variable resistor. This is our variable resistor. So we have a variable resistor in the circuit diagram. So we vary 
we move that until we can get a zero value on the ammeter. It doesn't have to be always zero. Go for the lowest possible value so that you will be able to then keep moving and get a few values to draw your graph and see a pattern. Then you keep you move uh, keep moving the keep varying the variable resistor and then each time make a note of the voltage and current readings and uh, tabulate your readings. Then make sure you do at least six different you make sure you at least get six different values of voltage and current and then tabulate them draw a graph then what you need to do is before you start drawing a graph sorry I said draw a graph before you start drawing a graph well, if you had all these values of current and voltage are going to be say positive then uh, you need to swap the leads of the power pack then you will see that the values in the ammeter and voltmeter becomes negative repeat exactly the same thing that you did for the positive values of uh, a meter and uh, uh, current and voltage and then we can draw the graph once we have around six different readings for both positive and negative values of current and voltage we can replace the fixed resistor by a filament lamp and we do exactly the same thing again okay keep the real, uh, variable resistor at the minimum current possible and start moving it and for each time you move make sure you note down the voltage and current readings so you have six different values then you stop there swap the leads of the power pack you get positive and negative uh, you get negative values in both the ammeter and voltmeter another six set of values then all ready to draw a graph once this much is done, one more uh, component is left, which is our diode. Then you keep the connect the diode and then repeat the same steps. Now, when you connect the diode, you have to be careful. Diode connects LED or the normal diode. It connects only in one direction. So when you connect the diode, please first time when you connect it, Please make sure that the positive of the cell is connected to the positive of the diode and the negative of the cell is connected to the negative of the diode. So with that done, you get uh, the values for a um, fixed resistor, you get the values for a filament bulb and you get the values for a diode and you draw the graph. When you plot the graph, this is the shape of the graph you would expect to see. So fixed resistor, you can see a red and a green, uh, yellow. which color is that? Sorry, it looks like by the end of the day, I've become colorblind. If you look at the fixed resistor, you can see a red and a blue line. Don't worry about that. That is done at two different temperatures. We are going to do it only at one temperature. You should be ideally getting a straight line that passes through zero, zero. And that tells you that they are directly proportional. And since this VI graph is a straight line for a fixed resistor, it tells you that the fixed resistor obeys Ohm's law. Filament lamp or filament bulb, you can see there is no straight line, so they will not obey uh, Ohm's law. And the diode, if you look, initially you can see, if you look at uh, the initial part of the graph, you can see that initially there is no current. So you have the voltage has to increase beyond a particular value for it to start conducting. So that tells you that initially in this part, the resistance is very, very high and then the resistance starts to decrease. Again, here also you have the uh, link to a video there. So it is very simple. You do all the connections using the variable resistor, you find five to six different values of voltage and corresponding current make a note of it swap the leads again using the variable resistor you find five to six values of current and corresponding voltage only difference will be the set all the values are going to be negative and then do the same thing for a bulb and the same thing for a diode now for accuracy in this one what should you do 
any electricity experiment you are doing, please make sure you switch off the circuit in between so that the components don't get hot. And, and when you're doing this, make sure for safety, make sure you're, keep, you're not keeping it in anywhere near anything that has uh, access to water. So not near a tap, not near a sink. So that is to do with the safety. And then to do with the accuracy, please make sure you have switched off the uh, you switch off the, compo uh, the circuit whenever you are not using it. And again, to do with the safety, the bulb might be hot. So wait for a couple of minutes before you try to touch it. OK, so with that, I'm coming to the end of the second section. And then whichever one is left, I will be doing in the third part. See you soon in the third. See you soon for the third part.